am Jennifer Foxworthy and I am a domestic violence driver. I came from a broken place. As a young girl, I was looking for love and acceptance in the wrong places and I didn't feel pretty. My self-esteem was low and I didn't know my worth. I was punched, slapped, and called names. I was lied to and missed all the warning signs. But today, I am happily married to my loving husband, Tom. I am a mother, an author, a motivational speaker, an entrepreneur, and I am your host of Living Unshackled On Purpose. Welcome back to another episode of Living Unshackled On Purpose. I am your host, Jennifer Foxworthy. Are you in a broken marriage? Have you been betrayed or deceived by fellow Christians? Have you contemplated or thought about suicide? Well, my very special guest, Dr. Reverend Unia Pettis, is going to take us on a journey of how she survived and thrived and overcame it all on purpose. I always like to give God glory. Thank you, Jesus, so much for waking us up today. Thank you for your traveling mercies and grace. Yes. I ask that everyone who is watching this segment that they will truly be blessed by Nia's interview and that it will be a blessing into their soul, dear Lord. I just thank you so much for this platform and ask that you just have your way. Yes. In Jesus' name, Jesus. amen. Thank you for watching today. My name is Reverend Dr. Unia Pettis with Nobody But God Ministries out of Washington, D.C. And you're going to hear my testimony of how God took me from three to four to five to, yes, six years of marital abuse at the hands of my preacher husband. I had been beaten, slapped, cheated on, did everything I could, and eventually tried to take my own life by an overdose of pills. But God had another call. I'm an overcomer on purpose, and I'm glad to be here with you today. Thank you so much, Unia, for being on Living Unshackled on Purpose. Thank it is you. an absolute pleasure to have you here. Oh gosh, you're such a blessing, a blessing in my life, and I know that you're going to be a blessing to those who are watching right now. Um, so you are an overcomer on purpose. Absolutely. You have been through some horrific things, and I want to know more about that. What was your childhood like? Was there certain things that shaped how your adult life would would be? Right. Well, thank you first, Jennifer, for allowing me to be living, as I call, unshackled. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I just thank you for your advocacy work in domestic violence and sexual assault and allowing this platform for others to be informed and educated and enlightened. So bless you, woman of God, for Thank allowing you. God to use you. Thank you. My testimony is probably like just anyone else. You're just a regular young lady. My mother had me as a single mom. Mm -hmm. She moved from Greenville, South Carolina to come to Washington, D.C. to wow. pursue college. Okay. Well, she met my dad at a party, and here am I. So I interrupted her plans, <laughs> and um, but thankfully she had a village. Uh, I had an aunt um, on Pearl who was really helpful in help raising me, and at one point my mother sent me back to Greenville, South Carolina oh. to be reared. One thing that she did not know, and this is the first time I'm gonna share this on a television interview, is while staying in South Carolina for a period of three to four years, I was sexually molested mm -hmm. by Jesus. someone who um, I was entrusted to and it was devastating to me and that was the first time I learned the boogeyman was real mm. because when I was first assaulted I did tell the person who was taking care of me and they didn't believe me and they spanked me and told me I was lying so victimized so over I, again very early on I learned that someone can hurt you who can be your caretaker someone can hurt you who can be a family member or someone who's around you and literally the boogeyman became real how did you process what you were going through for all those years, mm -hmm. uh, were, did you, it's anger, I, did you become depressed or isolate within yourself? You, those are some of the normal behaviors of someone who experiences. Well, what I did, and through. I've been through therapy since, 
the one thing that you feel when you've been molested is you feel you lose control. Mm -hmm. So when I grew up, I realized no one else is going to touch me there. there so it's very important for me to be a virgin. Mm -hmm. Very important for me to be celibate yes. because I felt that if the person who was near and dear to me could violate me, I felt every man could violate me. So I wasn't going to allow you to get close. So in the process at 25, I said, Lord, I'm just not going to date anymore. Mm -hmm. I just received my master's. I was making over $100,000, had wow. a condo in DuPont, doing quite well. Right. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to wait until you send me the right person. Amen. I'm tired of going on dates. I don't want to be in a relationship with just anybody. Mm -hmm. And along came this person who I used to work with who was a preacher. Now, be careful about, uh, what is it, wolves in sheep clothing? Amen. And yes, be very about careful that. about what you pray for. Because yes. I was very insistent, Lord, I want a man of God. Ooh. I would love for him to be uh, a preacher right. or a bishop or someone who governed and led the Lord, let, you know, let the Lord lead him. And mm -hmm. So be very careful what you ask for because you just Absolutely. might get it. Right. Um, we went through the relationship. I said I was celibate. He said he had no problem with that. Okay. Um, we got married. Literally at 4 o'clock there was a wedding. We get back to my hotel at 12. I come in to our suite, and he looked at me and he said, you look like S-H-I-T, and slammed the door in my face. What? The very night I got married. What? The very night I got married. And then, oh, after that, he locked me out. I'm still in my wedding gown. I'm sleeping in the outer vestibule. I go downstairs and I tell them, can I get another key? There are other guests in the hotel, my mom, I didn't want anybody to see me. I said, we've been locked out. And they said, well, you know, no, you just press this, the code. And I said, well, we're arguing. The lady at the front desk looks at me like, you are arguing this? You just got married? I mean, I had a huge wedding girl. It was ridiculously large. And I said, I just need a place to sleep. So she gave me another room. He calls the room because I tell him where I am. And he wakes me up at six and says, it's time for church. We were at church at seven o'clock. I was in my white outfit, sitting beside my preacher husband. We stood up and everything was whatever. So from that moment on, I became a culprit, a part of, because whatever he saw, whatever it was, I just immediately assumed something's wrong with me. I did something wrong. So maybe he didn't like the dress, I don't know. Maybe he didn't do this. But him cursing me out and telling me that, I immediately internalized that and said, let me fix it. So I'm gonna go to church tomorrow, we're gonna fix it. Now, was there warning signs prior to the wedding day? He told me that now you're my property. You have officially become my property. He quoted scriptures all the time about wives being submissive to their husbands. And he told me that, were you wearing that dress to show off for everybody else or for me? Mm, my goodness, but that was not, was that, that was during the dating time. No, that was the day of the wedding. Day of he the never wedding. He never even raised his voice to me ever in life. Ever. That's why they're warning signs. That's why I want to tell your listeners. People always say, my mother always said, if a man treats his, if, his, if a man respects his mom, right. <clears throat> that's a good man. Right. If he respects his sisters, that's a good man. He adored his mom. Very good to his sisters. So those rules are out the road. A man mm -hmm. can be a wonderful mama's boy and all of that and still treat you like an idiot. Um, wow. What I learned later is he was hiding something that was going on in him. Okay. What I should say is I married him, he had kidney failure, and he wanted a church. So eventually later in like three or four weeks into the marriage, he said, you know why I married you, Nia? I said, why? He said, in order to be a pastor, I need the first lady, mm. and I'm dying, and I need a nurse. So I was to be the first lady and the nurse, but oh not gosh. to be his partner. And so consistently, he emotionally and verbally abused me. I was starting my doctoral program, and he said, why are you trying to do that? You're trying to make a black man look bad. I don't have my master's yet, so you're just trying to one-up me. Mm -hmm. So he would take my books, tear out the pages, take my assignments, throw them away, take my laptop, throw it away. So I would have to literally commute from D.C. to University of Maryland College Park and hide books in libraries, hide books, in, because word. if I kept it at home, he was going to destroy it, but I was refusing to allow him to stop me from finishing my degree. Sis, I'm gonna stop you right there. We're gonna take a commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Unia is sharing her amazing testimony of Overcomer on Purpose. No more fear, no more shame, no more doubt, low self-esteem, resentment, I am releasing the shackles.
I am taking my identity back. I am taking my family back. I am taking my career back. It is a new day. I am releasing the shackles. I am Jennifer Foxworthy. This is Living Unshackled on Purpose. Join me as we take a 360 degree perspective on how to release the shackles in your life personally and professionally. Welcome back to Living Unshackled on Purpose. I am your host, Jennifer Foxworthy. Sis, um, before we took the commercial break, you were right on the com on the wedding day. Right. It's the most beautiful day that yes. a young lady expects to have, and the first incident of verbal and emotional abuse occurred right there in our honeymoon suite. Isn't that something? And so, and so we can fast forward. Yes. Um, I just briefly stated that he did have an ailment mm -hmm. um, when we got married. And there were some people who said, well, why don't you wait until that ailment is, is um, taken care of? He needed an organ. Um, and I said, well, would you not love someone any right. less if they didn't have this? Say, for instance, it was me. Right. And so he was a wonderful boyfriend, a wonderful fiance. Um, once he became my husband, I literally became his property. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, he was an assistant pastor. He wanted to be a pastor. So he sat me down like the third or fourth week of marriage and said, I married you for two reasons. One, I needed a nurse because in case I'm dying, I need a nurse. And in order to be a pastor, I need a first lady. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you fit the bill. We went through a year of marital counseling. And when I told you about being molested mm -hmm. uh, when I was a child, that was the first time. I mentioned it in marital counseling because, of course, we were celibate and the pastor goes into your finances, communication, and all that kind of stuff. So he gets into the nitty grit and I'm like, well, there are some concerns I have because I was taken advantage of starting at five years old. And he was very supportive. You know, okay. I cried and I said, is that going to be a problem? He said, no, baby, I still look at you as my pristine queen, you're my virtuous woman, my good thing. He said all those things. but. Later in the relationship, he told me I was contaminated oh, wow. and that I was dirty. Mm. And he threw it back up in my face. So wow. it was very sad to know that when someone is in your life, mm -hmm. and I even had this with a best friend. I had a best friend for 30-something years, and we talked all the time and shared everything. When God brings someone into your life who is deceitful, or you allow someone to come in your life who is deceitful, mm -hmm. the first thing they do is try to find out everything about you. Yes. Because in order to really betray you and hurt you, they have to know. The Judas the, is. Yes, yes. The Judas have to be close and, yes. and yes. there. So what I've realized after all of this, um, going into the marriage, she started having affairs, year three, year four, year five. By year six, I was sick and tired of you know finding out he was cheating on me. Wow. And I preached this Sunday. And it was a really good sermon, and I talked about how it's time for a turnaround. Okay, now. And that Tuesday morning, um, I woke up really early, and I got a call from this particular lover. And the person said, when are you going to leave? We sit back and laugh because we don't understand what is it going to take for you to leave. Mm. And I'm on the phone with this person who's telling me the all the things that I've tried to do to be intimate with him and how I've tried to do Victoria's Secret and all the things that a woman is supposed to do and how they sit back and laugh at me because there's nothing that he wants from me. And I get off the phone. The entire room, I was in my bedroom, it felt like the entire world went dark. I can imagine. Totally dark. Oh and I gosh. called him at his job, which is something you never do with him. You don't disturb him. So I called him and I said, blank, just call. It's over. And he said, when I get home, you're going to get it. So it was around midday. So I'm thinking, okay, it's around midday. He's going to get off in a couple of hours. I've never bothered him at his job. This is a church. And when he said, I'm going to get it, I know I'm going to get really get it. Usually he would slap me, punch me, kick me with his Timberland boots, kick me down the steps. Um, but I really felt this time it was going to be it. And so back then it was called People's Drugstore. I drove down okay. Georgia mm -hmm. Avenue. Now it's called CVS. Mm -hmm. Drove mm -hmm. down Georgia Avenue and I was still in the days, but I went there and I, and I said, where are the sleeping pills? And I bought three or four different boxes of sleeping pills. Now, I don't know why the lady behind the register didn't say, ma'am, why do you need so many? Right. It was kind of like I wanted her to say something to me, but she didn't. Mm -hmm. So I got them. 
He had recently had hernia surgery, so he had some pain pills. Went in my kitchen, don't know where this came from, except this was satanic, because the devil just totally took over my mind Absolutely. and my spirit. Absolutely. Mind you, Sunday I'm preaching down in the house. Tuesday, I'm up here buying sleeper pills, crushing them up with pain pills. There was some applesauce in my refrigerator, and I'm just making this concoction, because the one thing is not gonna happen, he's not gonna beat me today. So I'm just beating it and beating it, beating it, stirring and stirring and stirring, it, and I'm taking it. A part of me wanted to call my mom, but if I just called my mom, she would have, just by saying mom, she would have heard something in my voice and it would have stopped me. Right. And I wasn't going to be beat again. So I start taking the pills, crushed up in the applesauce, and I'm falling on the floor because everything's getting really, really dark. And I hear my mother say, baby, he's not worth it. Right. It was like an Praise angel. God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise and God. A little bit of it came out on the floor, and I'm just out of it. Five hours later, I'm in the emergency room, and he's bringing me there. And so they're putting these tubes down me, and you know, this, um, this concoction where they give it to you so it's sulfur and everything, so it'll take everything away. And the nurse said, what happened to you? And I'm just looking. And, mm -hmm. and, and he said, she tried to take her life. You know, he's trying to talk. <laughs> and the nurse said my vitals, every time he said something, kept going up and mm. up. So her being an angel, she said, sir, can you just back up? So they're still trying to give me this. And I'm looking at her, and I'm just thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is the way I'm going to go. And I look at her, and I said, ma'am, he's been beating me. And she said, what? I said, he's been beating me. Can I call my mother? And she looked at me. And she looked at the doctor, and she said, who are you? I said, I don't know. She said, he says you're a preacher. I, said, I don't know. She said, he says you're a professor. I don't know. The mm -hmm. only thing I could remember was my mother's number. Lord, have So mercy. I get on the phone, and I call my mother's number. I said, hello? I said, mom? She's like, yeah. I said, I'm at the emergency room, and they're pumping my stomach and everything. She said, what's wrong? I said, I tried to take my life, mine. She said, why? I said, he's been beating me. And he was going to kill me. And she screamed this visceral cry like a mother. Gotcha. She said, I'm on my way. And so they asked me who was the president. It was Bill Clinton. I couldn't tell them. Wow. I couldn't tell them anything. So they admitted me to the psych unit with no, just a flat bed, it's like a steel bed, no sheets, no nothing, you're on suicide watch. Right. And they let my mom come up, my uncles, and they're like, what happened? I said, he's been beating me for six years. And they said, why you didn't tell us? And I said, I didn't believe in divorce, and I didn't want to be a failure. I didn't want to disappoint the church. Absolutely, and as Christians. And I didn't want to disappoint God. Absolutely. Because I felt it was my fault. If I was getting beat, it was my fault. I could have cooked better. I could have done something better. But whoever is getting beaten realized it's not your fault. That's right. It is not. And love doesn't hurt. That's right, sis. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Living Unshackled on purpose. Are you current with today's job search and network strategies? Do you know how your social media profile impacts this? Well, if you have to think about the answers to those questions, you should know that today's job market is more competitive than ever, and social media is at the forefront. Do you want to compete? Then your strategy must be top-notch in order to break through the noise. As your chief career consultant, not only will I help you be seen, but heard. If you are over being overlooked, let's talk today. Now, are you ready to get career ready? Welcome back to Living Unshackled on Purpose. I am your host, Jennifer Foxworthy. Thank you for not going anywhere, Unia. You survived the suicide. What was that like? Because you don't look like what you've been through. Wow. To be a, a thriver, I'll call it. So you're laying on there, you call, talking to your mom. Mm -hmm. Well, I went through the therapy. I, I did the work. I had to go through extensive 
inpatient therapy and then outpatient therapy. Okay. And I had to dig deep and uh, resolve the issues. And the blessing is I don't look like what I've been through oh, because I was able to reconnect with God. Amen. The spiritual disconnect, the place where I felt that I was so alone that God couldn't reach me in that pit. Mm. And I know there's somebody in a pit still today, yes. but thank God for the pit because God created the pit for us to be able to be lifted up. Amen. Because he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. How did you maneuver out of the relation, the marriage? Mm -hmm. So the first thing I had to do after therapy, I filed for divorce. Yes, Amen. I divorced him. Snap, snap. Yes, I did. <laughs> and I thank God for it um, because that took a lot of strength. Yeah. It's Grieving a divorce is a big deal, but the fact that I walked out on my terms, mm -hmm. I had to take my power back. Yes. The power was taken from me, but through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, who is God. greater as he Thank that's in me, I took my power back as a woman of God. Yes. And I haven't been married since, but I'm whole, I'm favored. Yes. I still think I look okay, praise look Jesus. Beautiful, <laughs> and most importantly, I'm still being used by God. So the five eyes that I found in my research and in doing advocacy work since then, five eyes, the warning signs, because I want every woman, every auntie, every girlfriend to know there are warning signs that happen when you're dating someone. Yes. The first sign is isolation. Mm -hmm. They'll try to get you to themselves. And, and as young people, especially, they like that. They mm -hmm. like the time with their boo and you're texting and Snapchatting and kicking and all that and Facebooking. He'll isolate you because he wants to get you into a world where he becomes your bubble. Yes. Um, after that becomes um, intimidation. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in high school age and older, they'll say things, if you leave me, yep. if you leave me, Jennifer, I'll kill myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I won't make it in me if you leave me. If you do this, I'll mess up in school. So then there comes that whole intimidation and the threat start. Then it's a rationalization. Okay. That's when they kind of start stalking you. When I would go places, my girlfriends always said, he's the most attentive fiance, a boyfriend, or even husband. I would go places and he would say, what time are you gonna be there? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell him where I'm going. Well, as soon as I get there, page or call, you there okay, baby? I just wanna make sure you're fine. Tell me when you're leaving. This is really now, in hindsight, a tracking system. He's going where I'm going, what time I'm going to be there, all those kind of things. But at the time, I thought, well, he's just being attentive. He yes. can't wait till I get back home yes, and all that kind of stuff. But no, that's something that's not right. Then it will come to a point where he's irrational. Mm. That's where stalking comes into play. 20 and 30 messages, constantly leaving voicemails, threatens your family. One of the big things that my ex told me was that he was going to kill my mother and my aunt. He knew those were the two closest people to me. He told mm. me he was going to put sugar in my mother's gas tank. He was going to slit the tires. He was going to, because he said, until they die, I don't think you'll really just love me as just it. And so, an irrational, stalker, mental, deranged abuser, mm -hmm. and most people don't ever get physically abused. It's mind games and it's emotional. They'll do whatever they have to do to isolate you and then comes the incident of abuse. That's the fifth eye. What was the fifth eye? Incident of abuse. Incident of That's abuse. That's when it becomes significant. And when I say incident of abuse, at this point it becomes like slapping, stalking you, taking your keys, taking the kids from you. It's something where you have to involve law enforcement wow. or try to get help. It really escalates. The five overhead. eyes. Very insightful information. You were such an inspiration. So, Unia, you have Nobody But God Ministries. Yes. This is your book. Tell us a little bit about it and the different outreach that you do advocating around the country. Well, praise God. Thank you, Jennifer. The ministry is called Nobody But God Outreach Ministries. And the ministry involves me advocating, teaching, and preaching around the country, from schools to barracks to uh, conferences to retreats mm -hmm. to one-on-one -on -one to shelters, talking to women and men mm -hmm. about signs of abuse, what to do if you are abused, or if you know someone who abused, and how to get safe help. Wonderful. It's very important that you plan. You That's don't right. just get up and say, I'm going to leave. So the name of my book is Nobody But God, A Journey of Faith from Tears to Triumph. This came out in 2007 when my ministry was birthed. 
God has now taken my ministry to the next phase. All right. Now, now I'm in hashtag overcomer on purpose. I love it. I love I'm it. I'm not a victim. I'm not just a survivor. I'm an overcomer. Overcomer. Because Hallelujah. Because just to be a survivor means you've just been through something. Yes. I choose to overcome. Yes. I choose every day to wake up and say this day is going to be better than yesterday. And I choose to make a difference. If so I can touch anyone's life who's listening right now, and if you want to get in touch with me, you can go to www.uniaelpettus.com. That's U-N-N-I-A-L-P-E-T-T-U-S.com. I want you to know you're not alone. I want you to know you deserve better. 1-800-799-SAFE is the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Yes. Wherever you are in the country, one 800 799 S-A-F-E. They will put you in touch with free and confidential resources. They will put you in contact with law enforcement, advocates like myself who go to court with you, who will be there with you when you go into safety homes, who go with you to your jobs to help you get protective orders. You are not alone. Your enemy wants you to think you're alone. Yes. Your abuser wants you to think you're alone, but you are not. I appreciate you. I love you. I love you too. Um, and I thank you for this forum. And I know it's going to change lives. I speak prophetically that she's going to be global. I know that this ministry is going to bless so many. And the tears that we've sown, the scripture says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. So know that joy is on the other side. And weeping may endure for a night. Your night might be two hours, might be 12 hours, might be 10 years. But if you hold on, joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. I can't say anything more than that. Thank you, sis. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you, woman mm. of God. I hope that you were blessed with today's show. Unia took us on a very transparent journey of dealing with sexual molestation as a child, being in an abusive marriage by her preacher husband, committing, trying to commit suicide, but praise God that she overcame. She is an overcomer on purpose, and I know that you can be an overcomer on purpose too. So make that plan and get out of that relationship. God does not want you to stay broken. He does not want you to stay in a hurtful relationship. We serve an amazing God, a God of love. Be good to yourself. There are resources out there to help you. I am your host, Jennifer Foxworthy. Above all, beloved, I want you to seek to live on purpose. Join me next time on Living Unshackled on Purpose.